So good morning. Um, once again, I'm Father Thomas Bema, the Vice Rector for Academic Affairs here at the University of St. Mary of the Lake and Mundelein Seminary. And uh, we're back for round two of this year's Meyer Lecture Series. Uh, before we begin, I want to do just uh, uh, one additional uh, introduction. As I mentioned last night, uh, Dr. Uh, Craig's coming to Mundelein uh, is something of a, a homecoming uh, for him because uh, previously he was on the faculty of Trinity, Ev of Trinity Evangelical Divinity School and also is an alumnus of that school just 20 minutes down the road. One of our uh, fellow uh, seminaries in the Association of Chicago Theological Schools and our very good partner for the last, oh, really 40 years in the North Chicago Theological Institute, which the Mundelein students know as NCTI, which runs two cooperative courses every year, one in the fall, one in the spring, uh, which allows uh, students at the various seminaries to study uh, topics of interest together. As I said, this has been a 40-year operation. I took uh, one of those courses when I was a student here in 1976, and uh, uh, with some of the professors that Dr. Craig knew. Uh, so in part, uh, we wanted in, a, in an important way to acknowledge our long relationship with Trinity Evangelical Divinity School. Last night, uh, the school was represented by uh, Professor Harold Netland, and today we're very happy to have the dean, uh, Graham Cole, uh, with us uh, to represent Trinity uh, and to acknowledge this long-term uh, relationship our two schools has had. So, uh, Dr. Cole, thank you so much for coming and maybe greet our, uh, uh, maybe stand up and uh, let everybody see you there. Thank you. Uh, this morning there will be uh, three presentations. Uh, Dr. Craig will do his uh, second address, uh, this one on methods for sharing the gospel on college campuses. We will then take a short break, um, and uh, then when we resume, we will have, they're not really responses. A response implies that the, uh, the speakers are going to react to uh, the presenter's paper. Rather, what they are is two of our own faculty, Dr. Matthew Levering and Father David Olson, who will each be addressing the same topic that Dr. Craig did in one of his lectures. Uh, what philosophy offers to new evangelization and methods for sharing the gospel on college campuses. So in this way, we'll get a couple of more voices around the topics, and then the exchange can happen after that during the discussion period, an exchange between the speakers and with the, uh, uh, all of you who are present. So that's the order of the day, and with that, I will once again call up uh, Dr. William Lane Craig for the second of his lectures. Thank you and good morning. Last night I spoke of the value of philosophy for the new evangelization with respect to the task of shaping culture. Christian philosophy helps to create and sustain a cultural milieu in which the gospel can be heard as an intellectually viable option for thinking men and women. Philosophy is also of value for the new evangelization in a more direct and practical way as well. For philosophy undergirds the discipline of Christian apologetics, that branch of Christian theology which seeks to provide a rational justification of Christianity's truth claims. A positive apologetic for Christianity will comprise two major components, the arguments of natural theology and various Christian evidences. Natural theology is the branch of Christian theology which seeks to prove the existence of God apart from the resources of authoritative divine revelation. Christian evidences 
seeks to provide warrant for thinking that God has revealed himself decisively in Jesus of Nazareth. Unfortunately, in my admittedly limited experience, most Catholic apologetics seems to be aimed primarily at persuading Protestants to become Catholics rather than convincing unbelievers to become Christians. This strikes me as a case of misplaced priorities. Catholics and Protestants together face a common challenge in secularism, a challenge which has evoked the call for a new evangelization. What is urgently needed today is an apologetic for what C.S. Lewis called mere Christianity, those central truths which are common to all the great confessions of Christendom, whether Catholic, Protestant, or Orthodox. Now Lewis recognized that no mature Christian rests content with such a bare-boned Christianity. Mere Christianity, he said, is like the hallway into which one enters upon coming into a great house. Off the hallway are the various rooms representing the different confessions and denominations of Christendom. No one is content to remain in the hallway, for it is in the rooms that the couches and the fireplaces and the conversations are to be found. But in a secular culture, we first and foremost need to bring people into the house. Lewis lived through and wrote during the height of the positivist era at Oxford, the times of A.J. Eyre and the verification principle and the alleged meaninglessness of religious, ethical, and metaphysical discourse. He bucked conventional wisdom by presenting a variety of arguments for God's existence, and he rejected the relativity of history, arguing for the historical veracity of the gospel's record of the life of Jesus of Nazareth. Lewis was thus a champion of both natural theology and Christian evidences. If I may speak personally, my own approach to Christian apologetics has been inspired by Lewis's model. I have self-consciously focused on the defense of mere Christianity based upon the twin pillars of God's existence as demonstrated by a variety of arguments of natural theology and the resurrection of Jesus as established by historical critical studies of the New Testament whereby God vindicated Jesus' claims to divine authority. Because I have focused upon these central truths of mere Christianity, my apologetic work has been enthusiastically received by Christians of every stripe. Many people have expressed surprise when they learn that I am not Catholic, given my robust defense of these central truths of Catholic faith. Similarly, following speaking engagements, from Austria to Australia, I have been approached by Coptic priests with their flowing robes and black beards, along with groups from their congregations, enthusiastically thanking me for my contribution to their faith. I have even been told that the one monk at the Greek Orthodox monastery at Mount Athos who has internet access knows our website, reasonablefaith.org, and that as a result of his reports, the monks at Mount Athos are keeping me in their prayers. It is so gratifying to know that Christians of all these major confessions have found value and encouragement in my apologetic work. Christian apologetics not only strengthens Christian believers in their faith, but it is also of great value in the evangelization of non-believers. Let me share two ways in which Christian apologetics aids in the task of personal evangelization, particularly on the university campus. First of all, 
Training in Christian apologetics will make Christians more confident in sharing their faith with others. People who lack training in apologetics are often afraid to share their faith or to speak out for Christ out of fear that someone might ask them a question. But if you have good reasons for what you believe and good answers to the unbeliever's questions or objections, then you're not afraid to go into the lion's den. In fact, you'll enjoy it. Training in apologetics will help to make Christians bold and fearless witnesses for Christ. I see this happen all the time on university campuses when I have a public debate with a non-Christian professor. My experience is that while these professors may be very knowledgeable in their area of specialization, they are often almost clueless when it comes to the evidence for Christianity. The Christian position in these debates usually comes out so far ahead of the non-Christian position that unbelieving students often complain that the whole event was a setup staged by Christian groups to make the non-Christian position look bad. The truth is that we try to get the best opponents who are often picked by the atheist club on campus. Christian students, by contrast, come away from these debates with their heads held high, proud to be Christians. One Canadian student remarked to me following a debate, I can't wait to share my faith in Christ. Training in apologetics can help to raise up bold and fearless witnesses to Christ. Now, I can imagine some of you thinking, but don't we live in a postmodern culture in which these appeals to traditional apologetic arguments are no longer effective? Since postmodernists reject the traditional canons of logic, rationality, and truth, people are no longer interested in rational arguments for the truth of Christianity. Rather, in today's culture, we should simply share our narrative and invite people to participate in it. In my opinion, this sort of thinking could not be more mistaken. The idea that we live in a postmodern culture is a myth. In fact, a postmodern culture is an impossibility. It would be utterly unlivable. People are not relativistic when it comes to matters of science, engineering, and technology. Rather, they are relativistic and pluralistic in matters of religion and ethics. But you see, that's not postmodernism. That's modernism. That's just old line positivism and verificationism, which held that anything that you can't prove with your five senses is either just a matter of individual taste or emotive expression. We live in a cultural milieu which remains deeply modernist. Indeed, I think that the idea that we live in a postmodern culture is one of the most dangerous deceptions facing the church today. Modernism is dead, we're told. You need no longer fear it, forget about it. It's dead and buried. Meanwhile, modernism, pretending to be dead, comes back round again in the fancy new dress of postmodernism, masquerading as a new challenger. Your old arguments and evidences are no longer effective against this new arrival, we're told. Lay them aside. They're of no use. Just share your narrative. Indeed, some weary of the long battles with modernism actually welcome the new visitor with relief. And so we are deceived into voluntarily laying aside our best weapons of logic and evidence, thereby ensuring unawares modernism's triumph over us. If we adopt this suicidal course of action, the consequences for the church in the next generation will be catastrophic. 
Christianity will be reduced to but another voice in a cacophony of competing voices, each sharing its own narrative and none commending itself as the objective truth about reality while scientific naturalism shapes our culture's view of how the world really is. Now, of course, it goes without saying that in doing apologetics, we should be relational, humble, and invitational. But that's hardly an original insight of postmodernism. From the beginning, Christian apologists have known that we should present the reasons for our hope with gentleness and respect, 1 Peter 3.15. One needn't abandon the canons of logic, rationality, and truth in order to exemplify these biblical virtues. And as for the idea that people in our culture are no longer interested in or nor responsive to rational argumentation and evidence for Christianity, well, nothing could be farther from the truth. If I might be permitted to speak from my own experience, for over 30 years I've been speaking evangelistically on university campuses in North America and Europe, sharing the gospel in the context of presenting an intellectual defense of Christian truth claims. I always close my talks with a long period of Q&A. During all those years, virtually no one has ever stood up and said something like, your argument is based on Western chauvinistic standards of logic and rationality, or express some other postmodern sentiments. This just never happens. If you approach the questions on a rational level, people respond to them on a rational level. If you present scientific or historical evidence for a Christian truth claim, unbelieving students may argue with you about the facts, which is exactly what you want, but they don't attack the objectivity of science or history themselves. If you present a deductive argument for a Christian truth claim, unbelieving students may raise objections to your conclusion or premises, which is again precisely where the discussion should be, but they don't dispute your use of logic itself. Now, I do find that students can be suspicious of a Christian speaker, so they like to hear both sides of an issue presented. For that reason, I found debates to be an especially attractive forum for university evangelism. I competed for eight years in high school and intercollegiate debate activities, debating topics of public policy, like the military assistance program, wage and price controls, and so forth. I never dreamt the debate would someday become a ministry activity. But shortly after completing my theological doctorate, I began to receive invitations from Christian student groups in Canada to, to participate in debates on topics like, does God exist? Did Jesus rise from the dead? Humanism versus Christianity and so forth. And what I've discovered is that whereas a few score or maybe a couple hundred will come out and hear me give a campus talk, several hundred or even thousands of students will come to a debate where they can hear both sides presented. For example, just last month, 2,300 students at Ohio State University came out to hear my dialogue with Professor Kevin Sharp on Is There Evidence for God? At the University of Wisconsin in Madison, 4,000 students came out on the night of a basketball game, no less, to hear Anthony Flew and me debate the existence of God. 3,000 students at the University of Iowa braved a blizzard that dumped seven inches of snow on campus to hear my debate with a local religious studies professor known for his vendetta against Christianity. At Purdue University, 3,000 students came out to hear my debate with the young humanist philosopher, Austin Dacey, on the question, does God exist? The approach in all these debates is that of rational 
argument and evidence. There is tremendous interest among students in hearing a balanced discussion of the reasons for and against Christian belief. So don't be misled into thinking that people in our culture are no longer interested in the evidence for Christianity. Precisely the opposite is true. But an important question remains. Training in apologetics can make Christians more confident in sharing their faith, and people may be interested in hearing the arguments and evidence they present, but are the arguments and evidence effective? That leads me to my second point. Not only will training in apologetics help make Christians more confident in evangelization, it will help to make them more effective in evangelization. In other words, these arguments work. They have been battle-tested in years of university evangelism and shown to be effective. Many Christians will tell you that apologetics is not very useful in evangelization. Nobody comes to Christ through arguments, they'll tell you. I don't know how many times I've heard this said. Now, this dismissive attitude toward apologetics' role in evangelization is certainly not the biblical view. As one reads the Acts of the Apostles, it's evident that it was the Apostles' standard procedure to argue for the truth of the Christian worldview, both with Jews and with pagans. In dealing with Jewish audiences, the Apostles appealed to fulfilled prophecy, Jesus' miracles, and especially Jesus' resurrection as evidence that he was the Messiah. When they confronted Gentile audiences who did not accept the Old Testament, the apostles appealed to God's handiwork in nature as evidence of the existence of the Creator. Then appeal was made to eyewitness testimony to the resurrection of Jesus to show specifically that God had revealed himself in Jesus of Nazareth. So it's quite clear, I think, that the apostles were not reluctant to give evidence for the truth of what they proclaimed. That doesn't mean that they didn't trust the Holy Spirit to bring people to God. Rather, they trusted the Holy Spirit to use their arguments and evidence to bring people to God. Frankly, I think that those who regard apologetics as futile in evangelization just don't do very much evangelization. I suspect that they've tried using apologetic arguments on occasion and found that the unbeliever remained unconvinced. And then they draw a general conclusion that apologetics is ineffective in evangelization. Now, to a certain extent, such folks are just victims of false expectations. When you reflect that only a minority of people who hear the gospel will accept it, and that only a minority of those who accept it do so for intellectual reasons, we should expect that most unbelievers will remain unconvinced by our apologetic arguments, just as most remain unmoved by the preaching of the cross. We shouldn't expect that the unbeliever, when he hears our apologetic case, will just roll over and play dead. Of course he'll fight back. Think of what's at stake for him. But we patiently plant and water in hopes that over time the seed will grow and bear fruit. And who knows about the cumulative effect of such arguments as the seed is planted and then watered again and again in ways that we can't even imagine. Well, you ask then, why bother with that minority with whom apologetics is effective? Two reasons, I think. First, because every person is precious to God, a person for whom Christ died. Like a missionary, 
called to reach some obscure people group, the Christian apologist is burdened to reach that minority of persons who will respond to rational argument and evidence. But second, and here the case differs significantly from the case of the obscure people group, this people group, though relatively small in numbers, is huge in influence. One of these persons, for example, was C.S. Lewis. Think of the impact that one man's conversion continues to have. I find that the people who resonate most with my apologetic work tend to be engineers, people in medicine, and lawyers. Such persons are among the most influential in shaping our culture today. So reaching this minority of persons will yield a great harvest for the kingdom of God. In any case, the generalization that apologetics is ineffective in evangelization is just not true. My colleague, J.P. Moreland, has taken to answering those who say, you can't argue anyone into the kingdom of God by responding, oh, yes, you can, I've done it. When I first heard J.P. say this, it hit me forcefully, so have I. At our website, reasonablefaith.org, we receive a constant stream of emails from people who have come to faith or who have come back to faith through the discovery of apologetic arguments. Let me share a few of these letters with you. Stephen wrote the following. I am a sophomore at Ohio University. In April, I attended the Veritas Forum where you spoke and my life changed. That day, I went into your lecture not knowing it had anything to do with God or the Lord Jesus. In fact, I was invited by a Christian at work and we did not even know each other's names. While listening, I was shocked to hear the logical arguments you presented for there being a God and that Jesus exists. When you gave your testimony on the first night, I knew my life would never be the same. Now I finally have true happiness and peace by knowing that the Lord exists and loves me. Ike wrote from China, greetings from Shanghai. We met last year when you were here speaking at Fudan University. Some amazing stories happened here after the symposium last year. We were able to follow up some of the interested students from the lectures. Several people who went to your final lecture came to faith afterward. I hope God will use you and your fellows in great ways to empower his work here in China. Matt wrote, I gave some of your writings to an atheist co-worker. After reading your material, I think his exact words were, I couldn't believe it. Every criticism and question I had, which my former pastor could never answer, this guy answered. It was like he read my mind. He really messed me up. But I think I want to be a Christian now. He removed the biggest obstacle I have long had, thinking that Christianity was blind faith and could not exist in an intelligent mind. And finally, Johannes wrote from Sweden, I'm the only student in the University of Umeå, Sweden, that studied to take a degree in philosophy of religion, systematic theology. When I got saved as a 20-year-old metal guitar player, I started to study at a Bible school for two years. One day, I had a theology doctor teaching us, and he mentioned your name and that you had debated in Umeå. When he told the class about you and your debate, Something inside me almost exploded. It was something that I had missed my whole Christian life. My best friend told me that he had a book of you called Reasonable Faith. I read the chapter about the existence of God over and over again. A fire was turned inside me, and I started to read everything I could find in apologetics. Right now, I have been thinking to take a doctor degree. Today, 
I travel around and teach apologetics for pastors in churches and preach on my spare time. And do you know, one person I debated got saved. He is a physicist and I use the Kalam argument. Today, he is on fire for Christ and a clever apologete. One thing is for sure, I'm so grateful for your work. Those who say that apologetics is not effective with unbelievers must be speaking out of their limited experience. When apologetics is persuasively presented and sensitively combined with a gospel presentation and a personal testimony, the Spirit of God condescends to use it in bringing certain people to himself. One of the things Pope Benedict tasked the Council for promoting the new evangelization to do was to study and promote the use of modern forms of communication as tools for the new evangelization. I believe this is absolutely crucial. For that reason, I founded eight years ago a web-based ministry at reasonablefaith.org. I believe that the internet is one of the most effective forms of communication for sharing the gospel. Our website and two YouTube channels have extended the impact of our ministry to literally millions of people every year all around the world. One of the most creative and effective uses we're making of media is the development of animated short videos that we're creating on various apologetic arguments. And I want to share one of these with you this morning. Does God exist? Or is the material universe all that is, or ever was, or ever will be? One approach to answering this question is the cosmological argument. It goes like this. Whatever begins to exist has a cause. The universe began to exist. Therefore, the universe has a cause. Is the first premise true? Let's consider. Believing that something can pop into existence without a cause is more of a stretch than believing in magic. At least with magic you've got a hat and a magician. And if something can come into being from nothing, then why don't we see this happening all the time? No, everyday experience and scientific evidence confirm our first premise. If something begins to exist, it must have a cause. But what about our second premise? Did the universe begin? Or has it always existed? Atheists have typically said that the universe has been here forever. The universe is just there, and that's all. First, let's consider the second law of thermodynamics. It tells us the universe is slowly running out of usable energy. And that's the point. If the universe had been here forever, it would have run out of usable energy by now. The second law points us to a universe that has a definite beginning. This is further confirmed by a series of remarkable scientific discoveries. In 1915, Albert Einstein presented his general theory of relativity. This allowed us, for the first time, to talk meaningfully about the past history of the universe. Next, Alexander Friedman and George Lemaitre, each working with Einstein's equations, predicted that the universe is expanding. Then in 1929, Edwin Hubble measured the red shift in light from distant galaxies. This empirical evidence confirmed not only that the universe is expanding, but that it sprang into being from a single point in the finite past. It was a monumental discovery, almost beyond comprehension. However, not everyone is fond of a finite universe, so it wasn't long before alternative models popped into existence. But one by one, these models failed to stand the test of time. More recently, three leading cosmologists, 
Arvind Bord, Alan Guth and Alexander Vilenkin prove that any universe which has on average been expanding throughout its history cannot be eternal in the past but must have an absolute beginning. This even applies to the multiverse, if there is such a thing. This means that scientists can no longer hide behind a past eternal universe. There is no escape. They have to face the problem of a cosmic beginning. Any adequate model must have a beginning, just like the standard model. It's quite plausible then that both premises of the argument are true. This means that the conclusion is also true. The universe has a cause. And since the universe can't cause itself, its cause must be beyond the space-time universe. It must be spaceless, timeless, immaterial, uncaused and unimaginably powerful. Much like God. The cosmological argument shows that, in fact, it is quite reasonable to believe that God does exist. We're developing a whole series of these animated videos on various arguments for the existence of God and the historicity of the Gospels. These can be uploaded to your mobile device and then easily shared with a non-believer in personal evangelistic contexts. Most of us will not be involved in public speaking or debating on university campuses though you may be involved in helping to organize or sponsor such outreaches. But most of the time, our evangelization will be in personal conversation. Let me close, therefore, with some practical suggestions that will help to make you more effective in using apologetics in personal evangelization. Number one, don't allow the arguments to distract you from sharing the gospel. Use apologetic arguments only after sharing the gospel when the unbeliever has questions or objections. In many cases, you may not need to appeal to apologetic arguments at all. If you share with the unbeliever that God loves you and he responds that he doesn't believe in God, don't get bogged down at that point in trying to prove God's existence to him. Rather say something like this, at this point I'm not trying to prove to you that what the Bible says is true. I'm just trying to share with you what the Bible says. After I've done that, then perhaps we can discuss whether or not there are good reasons to think that what it says is true. Remember that our primary aim is to share the gospel, not arguments. Second, start simply. A discussion of the arguments is only as deep as the two people involved. For example, my wife Jan was once sharing her faith with a young woman in the student union. She told Jan that she didn't believe in God. My wife asked her, what about the argument for a first cause? What's that? She replied. Jan explained, well, Everything we see around us has a cause, and those causes have causes, and so on. This can't go back to infinity. There must have been a first cause which created everything. This is God. Now, that was obviously a very simple statement of the cosmological argument. The student responded, that makes sense. I guess I do believe in God after all. <laughs> Number three. Have a list of arguments memorized. I find that most students have no good reasons for their unbelief. Instead, they've just learned to repeat the slogan, there's no evidence for God's existence. This slogan is usually a mask for intellectual laziness, but it functions as an effective conversation stopper because most Christians are so ill-equipped that they have no evidence to offer. But if you have a list of arguments memorized, you can respond with a surprised look on your face. Is that what you think? Why, I can think of at least five arguments that God exists. At that point, the unbeliever has got to say, yeah, like what? And then you're off and running. 
Having a list of arguments memorized will turn the conversation stopper into a conversation starter. In fact, I've found that in many cases, just providing a list of the arguments is enough to satisfy the unbeliever. He doesn't even need to actually hear the arguments themselves. So, when someone challenges me to provide evidence that God exists, I'll typically give the following list. Number one, God is the best explanation why anything at all exists rather than nothing. Two, God is the best explanation of the beginning of the universe. Three, God is the best explanation of the fine-tuning of the universe for intelligent life. Four, God is the best explanation of objective moral values and duties in the world. Five, God is the best explanation of the historical facts concerning Jesus of Nazareth. And six, God can be personally known and experienced. Number four, memorize the premises of the arguments. Each of the arguments I just listed has certain steps or premises leading to the conclusion. These premises are usually very simple and easy to memorize so that they can be readily shared with an unbeliever. For example, the argument from the beginning of the universe goes like this. One, whatever begins to exist has a cause. Two, the universe began to exist. Three, therefore, the universe has a cause. If you have the premises of these arguments memorized, then you can share them with the unbeliever at the drop of a hat. Five, have some awareness of the evidence for the premises. You don't need to be an expert, but you should be able to say something in defense of the premises. For example, in defense of the premise that the universe began to exist, you could say that the evidence for the Big Bang Theory of the origin of the universe supports the truth of this premise. And then always be ready to refer the unbeliever to a book for further discussion. Six, stay focused on the premises. Don't get distracted by red herrings. For example, many unbelievers are hung up on what we might call Bible difficulties. But if your aim is to defend mere Christianity, then you needn't go into those. That's an in-house issue among Christians concerning the doctrine of biblical inspiration and its implications. Your case for mere Christianity doesn't depend on biblical inspiration or inerrancy. Rather, explain to the unbeliever, if you reject the conclusion of my arguments, then you must think that at least one of the premises is false. So, which premise do you think is false and why? Stay focused on the premises. Seven, never forget that our goal is to win people, not arguments. More often than not, it will be your personal character and testimony that will be most persuasive to the unbeliever. The arguments give him the intellectual permission to believe when his heart is moved. Don't spoil the effect of your arguments by a belligerent and mean-spirited demeanor. Show forth the love and character of Christ. The study of philosophy is thus a value for the new evangelization on both the cultural and the personal level. By being trained in Christian apologetics, we can become more confident and more effective in sharing the gospel with today's university students.